Just before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our fantastic sponsor, Scentbird. I've always been a plain dress, jeans and t-shirt type of guy. But, since I've been using Scentbird, I've been feeling kind of suave. When I go out to meet friends, they sniff me as politely as possible and then ask what cologne I'm wearing. Usually, they're impressed because Scentbird has high-end brands like Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, and Versace. While those usually smell great, other smaller brands like Skylar, Heretic, and Confession of a Rebel often have great colognes as well. If you don't know how Scentbird works, it's really easy. Every month, they let you choose a new fragrance for just $17. Then, you get a 30 day supply so you can try it out. Because imagine how horrible it would be to shell out a few hundred dollars to buy a bottle of perfume or cologne that you hate after a week. And if you love it, you can buy a full size bottle. And there are no surprises with Scentbird because you get to choose the fragrance. If you're feeling a bit overwhelmed when you start, just take a simple quiz and they'll suggest some fragrances for you. I'm always really excited when Scentbird sends me a package and this month was no different. They sent me David's Perfume No. 1, Amber and Cashmere, English Laundry, Noir Castle, and Get a Room by Confessions of a Rebel. Usually, when they send me three colognes, one usually sticks out as my favorite. But well, this month, all three were great, and I could find myself wearing them at different times. David's Perfume was really sophisticated and understated. English Laundry has this great clean smell with a scent of hitress, while Confessions of a Rebel has this wonderful vanilla scent. You should check out Scentbird for yourself. Make sure you use my coupon code CRIMINALL2 for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. So it's just a little over $7 for your first month. It's available in the United States and Canada. We just want to say a big thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Please check out the link below this video. Number 3. Stephen Chait In the spring of 1972, 20-year-old Stephen Chait was enrolled at Columbia University in New York City. He lived on campus in Fernald Hall. He worked part-time at Delicatessen. Stephen was the eldest of Harry and Gloria Chait's three children. He was always considered bright. His mother said he was reading the New York Times and U.S. News & World Report by the time he was nine years old. He was also a great athlete who excelled at track. He was on Columbia's relay team. Initially, Stephen was enrolled in engineering, but then he got a C in a key course and he was devastated. He had never gotten a C before, so he decided to change his major to art history. Even after changing majors, he was depressed by his perceived failure because he was a perfectionist. His mother said that he tended to feel like the world had failed him or that he had failed it. On March 13, 1972, Stephen spent most of the morning listening to music on his bed. He preferred classical music. He got up and put on his jacket and his knit hat. He told his roommate to take it slow and then walked out of their dorm room. 20 year old Stephen Chait was never seen again. His friends waited two days before they contacted Stephen's parents. Gloria and Harry reported him missing to the police. The police thought that he would return voluntarily, so no searches were conducted for him. Unfortunately, the police were wrong and Stephen's family never saw him again. But his mother may have heard from him. Starting on Mother's Day 1972, about two months after he went missing, she started receiving odd phone calls. The caller wouldn't say anything. She would get these calls two or three times a year. Gloria thought that the caller was Stephen. She would say his name and tell him she loved him. She also begged for him to come home. The caller wouldn't say anything. The caller would stay on the line for several minutes before hanging up. These calls continued for 25 years and then suddenly, in 1997, they stopped. Gloria kept a log of them. But she never found out who made the calls. Stephen's disappearance was hard on his family. 
Gloria was depressed and would cry often. Harry developed a drinking problem. Stephen's brother also suffered from depression. His sister found the sadness of the home unbearable, so she stayed away as much as possible. Gloria and Harry also lost all their friends because people felt uncomfortable around them. But eventually, things got better for the family. Gloria joined a support group for families of missing people and made new friends. Harry eventually quit drinking. Tragically, Harry died of a brain hemorrhage in 2002. In 2005, 33 years after Stephen went missing, Gloria decided to pack up Stephen's clothes and give them to charity. In 2012, New York City's medical examiner's office started exhuming bodies from paupers' graves on Hart Island. They were hoping to solve some missing persons' cases using new technology like DNA. But Stephen's body was not among the bodies that were exhumed. Gloria knew her son was depressed when he went missing, but she doesn't believe he died by suicide. Instead, she thinks he walked away from this life and started a new one. She hoped to find out what happened to her son during her lifetime, but sadly, she didn't. Gloria Chate died in June 2020 at the age of 91. If Stephen Chate is still alive, he would be 71 years old at the time of this recording. Number 2. Sherry Ellen Rowland In the winter of 1982, 20-year-old Sherry Ellen Rowland, who lived in Fort Worth, Texas, was enrolled in modeling school. One problem was that Rowland was 5'4", so she was too short to be a runway model or a high fashion model. However, people at the school still thought she could do specialty modeling and specialty photography. Roland worked at a 7-Eleven convenience store to make ends meet between modeling jobs. She started working there at the end of summer 1982. 20-year-old Sherry Roland went to work on the night on November 27th to work the overnight shift alone. Shortly after arriving there, she started receiving obscene phone calls. The calls disturbed Roland so much that she called her boyfriend. He told her to call the police, so she did. The police agreed to do checks on her throughout the night. An officer went to the store at 1.30 a.m. and he spoke with Roland. The calls had spooked her, but she didn't seem too worried. The officer came back at 2.20 a.m. He stayed in the car and Roland waved at him. At 3.52 a.m. he returned to the store for the third time. This time he didn't see Roland. He entered the store and saw a trail of blood leading to the back room. He followed the trail of blood. In the back of the store was the dead body of 20-year-old Sherry Roland. She had been shot in the right arm and the chest with a shotgun. Near the register were two spent 20 gauge shotgun shells. Her pants had also been pulled down. The medical examiner determined that she had been raped. The police checked the register. It appeared that Roland checked the register at 3 a.m. Then the killer pressed the no sale button to open the register. There was blood on the no-sale key. It's believed that the killer stole about $20, which is about $60 in 2022. The police said that the phone calls may be connected to the murder, but they refused to tell reporters what the caller said. They said they wouldn't be able to print most of it because it was pretty rough, pretty bad. The police had a long list of suspects. Many of them were suspects in other armed robberies in the area. However, they were all eliminated as suspects. In May 1983, five months after the murder, the police arrested a 20-year-old drifter named Leslie Dwayne Spawn. The police said he had made a statement that incriminated him. 
but the charges were later dropped because the police learned that Spawn was in jail on the night of the murder. After that, the case went cold, and it's been that way ever since. The police said that the case is open, and they are still investigating. They have not said for sure if the calls are connected to the murder. However, why are the odds that Roland received obscene and disturbing phone calls on the same night she was raped and murdered? It has been nearly 40 years since 20-year-old Sherry Ellen Rowland was murdered. Her surviving family members still hold out hope that her case will be solved. Number 1. Eve Strafford and Lynn Whedon Eve Strafford was born in 1953 in Dortmund, West Germany. Her father was an English medic who was stationed in West Germany after World War II. While she was young, the Strafford family moved to England and settled in Hampshire. In 1973, Strafford started working at the Playboy Club in London. She had the position of promotion bunny, so she was one of the top earners at the club. In 1974, the scale from Playboy magazine traveled from the United States to see if Strafford could be one of the playmates of the month. The scout thought that Strafford needed to lose a few pounds before she could pose for the magazine. After that, Strafford took a two-month leave of absence from the club and began visiting modeling agencies. She signed with an agent and got two modeling jobs. One was to appear on the cover of a South African crime novel. In the photo, a man is holding a knife to her throat. The second was Mayfair, a British adult magazine geared towards men. It's very similar to Playboy. Strafford posed nude for the magazine and she was Girl of the Month in March 1975. She used the name Eva Von Bach. Along with the photos was an interview with Strafford. The interview included the statement, If a man is truly a man and not effeminate in any way, he'll know how to handle me. I like to be dominated, not whipped and tied up or things like that, but just kept in my place. I get very bored with straight sex. I like playing little games with my lovers to turn us both on. Unfortunately, the Mayfair spread got Strafford in trouble at work. Posing for a Playboy rival was against the rules of the Playboy Club, so she was suspended from working there for three months. On March 18th, 1975, a few days after the magazine was published, Strafford met with her agent and then met with a publisher. She then purchased some dry flowers at a shopping center. She took the train home and arrived at her station at 3.45 p.m. She then walked three quarters of a mile to her flat that she shared with her boyfriend, Tony Preeze, and two of his bandmates. Priest was the lead singer of the psychedelic rock band, Onyx. The band had some success, but things weren't going well then, so Priest had a day job as a forklift operator. As Strafford walked home, it started raining. It's believed Strafford arrived home at about 4.10 p.m. When she got home, she stripped off her wet clothes in her bedroom. At 4.30, the downstairs neighbor heard Strafford talking to a man. 45 minutes later, the neighbor heard a loud thump, like a chair had fallen over. Then she heard footsteps going down the stairs. Shortly after that, the telephone in Strafford's flat started ringing, but no one answered it. At 5.25, about 10 minutes after hearing someone leave the flat, Strafford's boyfriend, Tony Preeze, and another one of the tenants arrived home. In the bedroom, they found a gruesome scene. 20 year old Eve Strafford had been brutally murdered. Her body was on the floor beside the bed. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear 8 to 12 times. She had been nearly decapitated. She was wearing a bra and underwear and negligee. The negligee was open in the front. 
The belt from the negligee, along with one of her stockings, were used to bound her wrist behind her back. Her other stocking was tied around one of her ankles. The medical examiner determined that Strafford had sex that afternoon, but it's unknown if it was consensual or rape. The police thought that the sex was consensual and that she was killed afterward. They thought this because there were no signs of a break-in or first entry. Plus, she was wearing her underwear, a bra, and the negligee. The police surmised if she had been raped, she probably would have been wearing less clothing. The police eliminated Tony Priest as a suspect because he had an airtight alibi. Another suspect was the photographer who took the photo of the crime novel. The police thought it was too much of a coincidence that he'd photograph her with a knife being held against her throat and that her throat was slit. But he was ruled out as a suspect as well. The police learned that Strafford started receiving mysterious phone calls shortly after the Mayfair issue was published. Sometimes the caller wouldn't say anything and then hang up. Other times he would threaten her or say obscene things. On the day she was killed, she received three of these phone calls. Another bunny who worked at the Playboy Club, Marilyn Looms, said that after she posed for Mayfair three months before Strafford, she received similar phone calls. The caller would threaten her or hang up. The police initially believed that Strafford knew her killer and the Mayfair issue set him off for some reason. They noted that the phone call started after the issue was published. But what was odd was that Mayfair didn't publish her real name. Plus, her phone number and address were unlisted. But the killer knew where she lived. After Strafford got home, she took out her clothes because they were wet. There were no signs of a break-in or first entry. This suggests that Strafford knew her killer and felt comfortable letting him into the apartment while she was only wearing her underwear and possibly a negligee. She may have even had consensual sex with him before she was murdered. But the police eliminated all the men in Strafford's life. Then, the case went cold. Nearly four years later, there was another murder that was very similar to Eve Strafford's murder. On January 19, 1979, mother of two, 29-year-old Linda Farrow, returned to the home that she shared with her boyfriend. Her home was five miles away from Strafford's home. Farrow and her husband had split up a year earlier. Farrow was four months pregnant with her new boyfriend's child. That afternoon, Farrow went out shopping. When her two daughters, who were 11 and 8, returned home from school, they found her dead body in the hallway. Her throat had been slid nearly to the point of decapitation. There were no signs of a break-in or first entry. The police thought that Farrow knew her killer. Or he was waiting for her to get home, and then he slipped into the home after she walked in the door. There were several similarities between the cases. Both victims were attractive women with blonde hair in their 20s. Both victims worked at night spots in London's West End. Their throats had both been slashed. They were killed in their homes with no signs of a break-in or forced entry. Unfortunately, no arrests were made in Farrow's case. It also provided no new suspects in Eve Strafford's murder. So both murders went cold. Decades went by. Then in 2007, over 32 years after Eve Strafford's murder, there was an unexpected break in her case. DNA from her murder had been linked to another murder. However, it wasn't Linda Farrow's murder. Instead, it was the murder of 16-year-old Lynn Whedon. Six months after Strafford's murder, on September 3, 1975, Whedon was out with friends. She started walking home alone. 
She walked down an alleyway she had been told not to use alone that night. But the alleyway was a shortcut to her home, so that night, she took it. As she walked, a man snuck up behind her and hit her on the head with a blunt object, possibly a lead pipe. This blow fractured her skull. The attacker picked her up and placed her on the other side of the fence where there was a power substation. He then dragged her to an isolated area. He raped her and left her there unconscious. The next morning, Whedon was found and she was taken to the hospital. She never regained consciousness and died a week after the attack. For many reasons, the two murders were not connected. One reason is that the two women were attacked on the opposite sides of London. Strafford was cut with a knife in her home and Whedon was attacked with a blunt object while walking home and then raped in a public area. Strafford was an outgoing Playboy bunny who had recently posed nude for a magazine and Whedon was a reserve schoolgirl. Strafford was stalked and harassed before she was killed and she possibly knew her killer. Whedon, on the other hand, was a victim of opportunity. Had DNA not connected their murders, investigators may have never surmised the same person committed them. After the connection was made, the police reopened Eve Strafford's case. They took DNA samples from 16 of the most promising suspects, but no match was found. The police also decided to reopen the murder of Linda Farrow. From the evidence, they got a sample of the killer's DNA. The DNA did not match the DNA of the man who killed Strafford and Whedon. In January 2009, on BBC's Crime Watch, a detective said that a suspect in Farrow's murder was her ex-husband. They believe he either killed her or hired someone to kill her. He was apparently unhappy that she left him, moved in with another man, and was pregnant with his baby. But by the time DNA profiles were generated, he had died. There is some speculation that Eve Strafford and Lynn Whedon were killed by a serial killer who murdered other women. However, the police have not publicly addressed other cases that they might suspect are connected. They have only confirmed that the same man killed Eve Strafford and Lynn Whedon. The police hope that the killer told someone about the murders and they'll come forward. Another possibility is that forensic genealogy may be able to help solve the crime. So it may just be a matter of time before one of Britain's most notorious pair of murders is finally solved. Thank you for watching today's video. We want to say a big thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Check them out using the link below. Well that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.